So this is a really nice slide because it shows you all three different types of brood in one frame, uh, which you may or may not see in your own frames, but this kind of gives a good example to draw from. So when you're pulling out hives and you want to see what kind of eggs have been laid uh, and what kind of brood you have, if you see like in the middle here, nice kind of flat cells, those are the worker cells. They're the smallest, so they take up the least amount of space. But the drones on the other hand, kind of in this bottom left corner, they're larger and so their cells, uh, their brood cells are a little bit larger as well. And they pop out of the frame, they kind of look like little pebbles. And then of course the queen cells, they're the easiest to find in an ideal world because they look like peanuts and they kind of protrude from the frame um, and fall downward. And so that's how you can tell the different types of bees that are going to hatch in your hive. So here's a fun little Where's Waldo? Does anyone see the queen? You, some of you are pretty fast, all right. She is, I'll use my shadow hopefully, she's right here. So you can see in that picture that she's slightly larger, um, but maybe not as significantly larger as some of you may have thought, but this queen is easier to find because she has a nice dot on her back. A lot of beekeepers will mark their queens with paint pens so it makes it easier to find. Do you guys know what the color is for this coming year? So this coming year, we will mark our queens with the color blue and that tells us that they are queens from the year 2015. So if I find bright green dotted queens in my hives, I know that those are from last year. So every year has a new color, which makes it easier to tell how old they are. This gives you an idea of the roles that a worker bee has during her lifetime. Uh, so worker bees can live roughly zero to about 42 days and in their life they serve a lot of different roles. So in their younger days they might be cleaning or nursing or fanning. As they get older they transfer nectar, they build wax, they guard the hive and protect it. And in their older days they forage and bring in all the wonderful nectar and pollen that helps create your honey. To go a little bit further into queen cells, uh, there's two types of queen cells that you might see in your hive. The one on the left is called a swarm cell. You'll usually find those on the bottom edge of your frame. As you're pulling a frame out, you might see them kind of hanging off down here. And that generally means, again, there's no rules in beekeeping, but that generally means that your hive has outgrown its space and it's going to take off or half of the bees will take off with one of the queens that emerges and they'll go somewhere else. On the contrary, the picture on the right is a picture of a queen cell called the supersedure cell, which it generally, again in theory, tells us that our queen is not doing very well and so the bees have decided, the worker bees have decided to replace her with a queen that maybe can perform a little bit better. This is another picture of some capped drone cells. Again, they are much larger in shape, look very bullet-like, and sometimes they're large enough that you might even start to confuse them with queen cells. Um, but the more you look at your hive and your frames, the easier you'll be able to tell the difference. All right, so hopefully that gave you a little bit of a brief introduction to the types of bees that are in your hive, what they look like, and what the brood looks like. So now we're gonna move on to the equipment that you might need. And I know this is probably a section that a lot of you uh, were curious about since uh, many of you probably don't have beekeeping equipment yet. So we're gonna focus on the Langstroth hive. That's the most common type of hive that beekeepers use. It makes it really easy to access the frames, uh, to check on the brood, to access the honey and to harvest the honey and then put it all back together. So it's a really great device. What I really want to point out before we start getting talking about the specific items that are included in this is that again, a lot of beekeepers do things very different. Some beekeepers use all deep boxes, which are pictured here. Some beekeepers use all shallow boxes, which are the shorter ones that look a lot like this. Some beekeepers use a mix of both. There's no perfect way to do it. There's no uh, way that's guaranteed to make you successful. Uh, so I'm going to give you the most basic information and I encourage all of you afterwards to do a little research to figure out what might be best for you. So we'll start from the bottom and we'll work our way up. So at the very bottom we have what's called a bottom board and it's the foundation for your hive. A lot of folks use solid bottom boards which again are just very, they're solid pieces of wood. Um, other folks use vented bottom boards like this. 
that instead of being solid, have uh, a wire mesh here that allows for a little more ventilation. This can come in handy in the summertime when it's really hot. It can also come in handy in the wintertime to keep your hive ventilated and dry, keyword dry, so that your hives can get through the winter more easily. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So there's a couple of options for bottom boards. I know D&B sells both of those options. Next up, we have our brood boxes. So our brood boxes is where our queen will lay her eggs and you will have brood. So for the sake of this, we're gonna call those brood boxes. And the one above it, we're gonna call a honey super. I'm not really sure why they use the term super, but for the sake of conversation, we will use the term honey super for the box that will hold our honey frames. So the brood boxes, uh, the, the one in this picture has eight frames, but there's also boxes that hold 10 frames. There's advantages to both. With eight frames, they're a little bit lighter. You have less to move around, less weight to pick up, and 10 frame boxes, you can maximize your space a little bit. And uh, these larger boxes are 10 and 5 eighths, or nine and 5 eighths boxes, and then the medium ones that I was referring to are six and 5 eighths. Using all mediums is also nice if you're worried about lifting weight and moving it around. So there's options there um, if you want to make a decision on that. And then above the brood boxes, there is a little device called a queen excluder. Not everyone uses a queen excluder, but you can choose to do so. The advantage of using a queen excluder is you can put it on top of your brood boxes, just like that picture shows. And then it allows it, the slots in it are large enough that it allows the worker bees to go up through them, but they're not large enough that the queen can go through them. So that guarantees that your honey will be up above your queen excluder, but you won't have eggs that are laid above your queen excluder. So when you go to harvest honey, it makes it really easy to know what boxes to grab um, and that you won't harvest any honey that has eggs in it. Makes it pretty convenient. So I'll pass this around if any of you just want to take a look at that. Above our queen excluder is our honey super, which is exactly like our brood boxes. We're just going to use it for honey. Some people like to use the mediums, the six and five eighths boxes, because they're a little bit lighter for moving around. This picture, they're all the, the deep supers. Above the honey super is a series of frames. There's an inner cover and a top cover. And an, inner, an inner cover is a, a piece of wood that has a oval or circle hole in the top. And some folks use it, some do not. It makes it really easy to access your hive because you can pop that inner cover off instead of trying to pry your top cover off, which can be a little bit more difficult. An inner cover isn't mandatory, but it can be helpful in some ways. And then a top cover definitely is mandatory. You want something to put on top of your hive to keep the elements out, to keep the critters and teenagers and all sorts of other things out of your hive. So this top cover is a telescoping top cover because it has a metal sheeting on top that helps uh, keep it uh, in good shape despite the rain and snow and sleet and other things. Uh, I know the ones that D&B sell has a coating on it uh, that replaces the need of the uh, metal sheeting there. So that's the basic setup for a hive. Um, in the summertime, when there's lots of honey, your hives might get taller based on how much honey your hive is producing. So now we'll talk a little bit about frames. So inside of your boxes, you are going to have a series of frames, either eight frames or 10 frames. And some frames are made of plastic, some frames are made of wood. I know the ones that D&B sells are wood frames that have a plastic foundation that's coated in wax that has the honeycomb uh, shape printed on it that allows the bees to draw out from it a lot easier and a lot quicker. Other folks that like to harvest comb honey, for example, will use frames that just have a series of wires that run across it so that they can cut the comb out without having to hit a plastic foundation that's in the middle. So there's a few options for frames. So you might figure out what would be best for you. So now we're gonna talk about the rest of the tools that you might need. So on this slide, we've already covered number one, the beehive, uh, with all of those options there. You can buy hive kits that are shown on this top right. And that includes your boxes, frames, and a few other tools if you're interested. You can also buy these components individually if you kind of want to mix and match things. So you can look at the options there. 
Uh, as far as the tool section, these are very important. There's a lot of tools out there that you can buy. I would consider these four the fundamental tools that you do need to start beekeeping, but there are a lot of other fun ones that you can add on. So first and foremost is the hive tool. Now my beekeeping mentor sensei once said that you're not a beekeeper unless you have a hive tool on you at all times. So I'm pretty sure that means he probably sleeps with it. He probably showers with it. Maybe he brushes his teeth with it. I don't know, but he keeps this thing with him at all times. And the reason that's important is because you don't want to be opening your hives and not have your hive tool because it is your ultimate multi-tool. So it has a uh, flat kind of sharp edge right here that's really useful for popping open the different hive bodies popping off the lid. It's also really good at scraping off bee wax that builds up around your hive. And then it has a curved edge here that you can use to, as a lever to move different frames apart from one another. So you can get your little fingers in there, pull them out and take a look. It also has this that can be used to pull out nails, to break your teeth, to do all sorts of fun things. Who knows? You can use this tool for literally anything. So keep it with you at all times when you're keeping bees. It fits perfect in a back pocket. It fits perfect in the pockets that are on a lot of the hive suits. So you wanna have this with you at all times. Secondly, our gloves. Gloves are really helpful, especially if you're a new beekeeper and maybe you're a little nervous to work with your bees. They protect your hands. Um, and they kind of help build up your confidence at first. I have found over time that going gloveless is very helpful because it allows you to feel what you're doing a little bit better. You can tell if you're pinching the bees, you can tell if you're squishing them, and it just makes you a little more conscious of what you're doing. And the reason that that's really important is when you pinch bees, they release a pheromone that tells the other bees that something's happening and that they need to come check it out. And it just makes their temperament not as comfortable for you. So you wanna be pinching as few bees as possible. So gloves are really helpful at first, um, but you can be a little more aware of what you're doing after a while when you get used to working with your hives. The third tool that's very helpful is a suit or a jacket. I know DMB sells little kid suits all the way through to large adult suits. Uh, the nice option about the unisuit is you can pull it over whatever you're wearing, zip it up, it covers your head, it covers your face, and you're ready to go. So it makes it really easy. You can just throw it over whatever you're wearing. It does get really hot in the summertime, so you got to be prepared for that, but it is a really nice convenient option. Other options are just the jackets, just the top up and covers your face uh, and your head. Other folks like to wear loose fitting jeans or uh, and a loose fitting top, long sleeves, and then they'll get a hat with a veil uh, to cover up their face. So there's a lot of options there. So you might figure out what's best for you and your time and your resources. And then finally, you can't be a beekeeper without a smoker, this nifty little tool here. A smoker, you can burn just about anything that will burn in here. You can put grass, you can put newspaper, wood chips, burlap, old cotton, just about anything that will burn can go in here. And uh, I'm still not a very good expert at getting this thing going and making it last very long, but I'll tell you that you definitely wanna make sure that you can get your smoker working and lasting for a while, because you don't wanna need your smoker and then have it fizzled out. So it takes a little practice, but this is definitely a tool that I encourage everyone to use.